So we'll start off with a couple of questions. The first one, um, uh, Monica, I guess, a uh, little bit of a trick question. M mean peer pressure for the current diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is 20, 25, 30, or 35. Um, I guess there's no way for a poll or anything here, I guess, but uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, you know, go to the next question. I just wanted to have these two questions for uh, just as a pre-test and, <clears throat> and then we'll do kind of a post-test question. So current guidelines suggest initial treatment for PAH should be a monotherapy with PD-5 inhibitor like sildenafil or tadalafil monotherapy with an ERA or dual therapy with PD-5 and ERA and dual therapy with PD-5 and a prostacycline analog. So uh, for this talk, we'll be going over the definition of pH and pH uh, and then sort of differentiation of pre-capillary and post-capillary pH and use of echo and uh, briefly some pathophysiology of pH, especially sort of with focus on what has been, I guess, uh, recently um, uncovered. We'll talk a little bit about risk stratification tools, which have really sort of come into the fore in the last uh, maybe five years, and then the, the treatment algorithm. So, you know, the, uh, for pulmonary hypertension, every uh, five years, there is a world symposium, which is held uh, between the US and, and Europe. And the last symposium was in 2018, wherein um, the, the cutoff for a pulmonary hypertension diagnosis was changed from uh, 25 millimeters of mercury to 20 millimeters of mercury. So the normal PA pressure in, in humans, um, at least when you look at mean, um, it is about you know 15 to 18 millimeters of mercury. So uh, initially, like in the in the fifth symposium and the fourth symposium, they had uh, come up with a cutoff of 25 because they, they chose you know sort of two standard deviations about the normal. And there was a new study which just came out in 2016, which said you know anything over 20 is really you know abnormal. So uh, that's why there was a suggestion in this meeting to move the needle down to 20. Now, this has been accepted by um, the European guidelines for pulmonary hypertension, the uh, one from uh, you know, the ESC, the European Society of Cardiology. But ACC, AHA, um, and ATS have really not uh, incorporated this into the guidelines. So the, the reason you know, that, that has bearing is because when you try to start treatment on patients who have just PA, I mean PA pressure of 20, it will be difficult to do in the US because a lot of insurers are not gonna pay. So anyway, but there is a push in, you know, in, in the community to, um, uh, uh, to diagnose early. And I think some of this came from, uh, and, and, and this, this change in the de definition came from that. So um, when we talk about pulmonary hypertension, uh, we are looking at just you know, the mean PA pressure, but pulmonary arterial hypertension is defined as mean PA pressure greater than or equal to 20 with a wedge pressure less than 15 and a PVR of greater than three woods units. So when, uh, for at least the first um, year fellows, uh, when you calculate PVR, so it is mean PA pressure minus the, uh, wedge pressure divided by cardiac output, which gives you the PVR. Um, at least in the most of the pH word, usually thermodilution is accepted as um, what we use rather than, unless you have an actual FIC, most people don't like to go off of calculated FIC because of use of oxygen uh, or supplemental oxygen in patients. Again, as you can see here, to diagnose pulmonary arterial hypertension, you definitely need a right heart cath. You cannot make the diagnosis just based off of echo. So going to the next slide. So the, this is the um, classification for pulmonary hypertension. And uh, the, the group one, uh, <coughs> 
uh, group one uh, pH uh, is is pulmonary arterial hypertension, where your vet pressure is less than 15. But so is actually pH due to lung disease or hypoxia and CTAP. So all of these could put, you know, have uh, wedge pressure less than 15. Uh, however, for pH, you have to have absence of alveolar lung disease or you know, intrinsic lung and absence of uh, uh, blood clot. So, or chronic, blood, you know, chronic pulmonary um, embolic disease. Um, so, if you were to go through the uh, the classification, it is really based on etiology. So, uh, idiopathic is where we don't know. Heritable is associated with certain genes that we'll talk about, and uh, drug and toxin induced are mostly medications related to um, amphetamine and we'll go over that too and uh, so some the, the this is this sub classification in ph is called aph which are associated with associated ph which is associated with connective tissue disease hiv portal hypertension um, with, with or without cirrhosis and um, congenital heart disease and schistosomiasis of course this is very rare in the developed world um so for the most of this talk, we'll concentrate on pH, and uh, I think we might have another talk on CTEF uh, sometime later. Um, so some of the new entrants to classification are, you know, uh, uh, one of the we all talk about when we do testing is to uh, look at um, vasodilator testing either with nitric oxide or adenosine or um, uh, IV flow lens slash valetri in the cat lab. And um, whatever agent you use, uh, if in the cat lab when you do the vasodilator testing, if your mean PA pressure uh, decreases to less than 40 with a absolute decrease of greater than 10 with no hypotension or decrement in cardiac output, those are called responders um, and nitric oxide responders. And the key here is to consider using this only in idiopathic pH or heritable pH. This should not be generally tested in patients with connective tissue disease because a lot of them will be responders, but it doesn't mean they are going to respond to calcium channel blockers. So, uh, Amongst these people who, have, who are called responders, you can put them on high dose calcium channel blockers. When I'm saying high dose, it usually means 20 milligrams of amlodipine or you know, um, uh, about 160 to 320 milligrams of nifedipine or higher doses of, uh, of diltiazem. And uh, a lot of them will have sustained clinical and hemodynamic response at, at one year. So um, usually it's, it's in the order of 10%. You know, if you have about 10% uh, of the idiopathic heritable pH patients respond to nitric oxide, only 10% of them are long-term responders. And uh, what they did uh, during this classification is actually created a subcategory for these patients because their prognosis is very different. And also, they, they, and, uh, there is a recommendation now to do testing at one year so that we can demonstrate there is, that there is long-term responsiveness. So the other things which uh, got added after this sixth symposium were that there, uh, there were three other um, uh, drugs which were clearly associated with pulmonary action. Uh, Benflurex is a weight loss medication, methamphetamine as, as a, a, a drug, and desatinib um, is a clear um, uh, there's a clear relationship with causing pH. And uh, in fact, in uh, at least in my clinic, I have a couple of patients who've had desatinib and now have developed pulmonary hypertension. So uh, the only thing with desatinib uh, related pulmonary hypertension is that uh, there is the very good, re I mean, reasonable response, I would say 40 to 50% of the times that if you discontinue desatinib, the pulmonary hypertension goes away. 
So in terms of pathologic lesions in PAH, uh, you know, um, we are all familiar with sort of the plexiform lesions. So the classic uh, features which come with PAH are intimal hyperplasia, smooth muscle hypertrophy, and because of endothelial dysfunction, once you get, uh, you know, uh, onion skin lesions, eventually you will have endarthritis and you will have thrombus formation in small arteries. Um, so that's uh, organizing thrombus is a very common feature of uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is something that you could be, you know, asked a question on your boards. Uh, now, in terms of, uh, again, this is just a reiteration of uh, what I just said, that there is dysfunctional pulmonary endothelium, altered secretion of pulmonary vasodilators and vasoconstrictors, and there's a pro-inflammatory phenotype, at least locally, even with smooth muscle uh, hypertrophy. So recently, they have actually found out that there is a definite uh, role of inflammation locally, and uh, there is immune cell filtration uh, with the lymphoid neogenesis and uh, uh, soluble factors of cytokines, chemokines, uh, which all play a role in causing this uh, uh, medial hypertrophy and intimal hyperplasia. So um, now sort of getting into the more clinical realm, you know, when should you uh, suspect pulmonary hypertension? in a patients with exertional dyspnea, syncope, angina, and progressive limitation of exercise capacity. And um, oftentimes, especially with idiopathic uh, PAH, uh, you know, it happens in young people and we don't really necessarily think about PAH all the time, but that is something to keep in mind. And, um, and, uh, and of course, one of the screening tests Yes, for uh, pulmonary hypertension, which we all do, our patients who present with uh, shortness of breath all get an echocardiogram. And, and you look at the TR jet, and the upper limit of resting values for peak TR uh, gradient is really you know 2.8 millimeters uh, per second. And that ca calculates out to a peak systolic pressure of 35. And... Uh, uh, that will give you sort of a mean pressure of 20. So anything greater than that will, you know, is something that you have to pay attention to in trying to figure out if this is, you know, first first thing to establish is whether the patient has pH. And then we can decide if the patient has PAH or, you know, other groups of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Of course, the largest group of pulmonary hypertension in the world is who group to pulmonary hypertension. And that is what is associated with left heart disease. And that's what we see the most as cardiologists. Uh, this is a normal echo, right? Uh, I don't need to go over the ventricles and, and, and look at the RV. There's you know, good longitudinal motion here at the annulus, you know, normal RA size. Um, and, but here is a markedly dilated RV and the annulus is barely moving and markedly dilated right atrium and the intraatrial septum bulging towards the left suggesting of increased right atrial pressure and the same with the ventricular septum bowing towards the lv both in systole and diastole suggesting of both volume and pressure overload and i think you will see that better here right so and uh, uh, this is a normal and this is uh, somebody with uh, pulmonary arterial height. So these, these are some of the other things which, again, uh, came up with in, in this symposium is to actually uh, come up with uh, kind of an echo uh, score, if you would call, uh, to um, diagnose pulmonary hypertension early. This, so the reason uh, there is so much stress to diagnose pH early is because currently the average lag from the time of, di from the time of symptoms to diagnosis is about 18 to 24 months worldwide. And uh, I think by then, the disease has already progressed and you're always playing catch up. So uh, syncope is a part of uh, the WHO functional class, which we use for pulmonary hypertension. It's very similar to NYHA functional class, except that there is syncope, which would make them a class four and near syncope will make them class three. And uh, we all, pretty much in all these patients, they get six minute walks every you know, three to six months to look at their trajectory. 
and uh, the magic number is 165 and 440. If you are greater than 440, then you're low risk. Um, and most of our patients kind of are in the intermediate risk, uh, you know, uh, category. Uh, and uh, we don't do much of cardiopulmonary exercise testing, but it can be done. Uh, and of course, anti-pro BNP and you know, imaging uh, surrogates of uh, RV failure, and uh, and 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 hemodynamics uh, again, looking at cardiac index, and so in looking at at RV systolic function and diastolic function with uh, right atrial pressure. So um, recently, there was a large registry, which was actually ind industry sponsored, which had about 3,000 patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension in the US. And they followed them for many years, I think average of, let's say, five years, and then came up with a score, uh, could tell, tell us you know, who would be high risk in the next 12 months of not doing well. And uh, again, it uses a lot of the same things that the European risk score does uh, that we talked about in the previous slide, uh, NYHF or WHO functional class, um, you know, echocardiogram findings, especially of pericardial effusion, which is uh, essentially a finding of right atrial pressure being very high. Uh, and, um, uh, and then you add six points to it and calculate a risk score. Um, now this this risk um, calculator is available online for you all to, you know, do this uh, with pay. Come in initially, but also this is really useful to look at their trajectory. Um, and, uh, you know, we do this uh, oftentimes in clinic, especially in these sort of intermediate patients to see if they are truly high risk or not. So using these scores, I think, really helps parsing out those intermediate patients because with clinical gestalt, you can usually figure out those high risk and low risk ones. You know, somebody coming in with, you know, EVE and JVD up to the jaw, and you know, ascites, pulsatile liver. You know, they are high risk. You know, you don't need to like uh, do risk scoring. And the same with low risk people who are ambulating, walking 600 meters, and you know, they are not on oxygen but have pulmonary hypertension. You know, they are low risk. But it's the intermediate ones in whom you really need these risk scoring systems to be able to you know, up or downgrade their risk. Um, so like I said, you know, with uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, it is really sort of a disease of the right heart. So this is the initial phase of patients are pre-symptomatic. And as you can see here, the PA pressures will continue to rise till you hit a threshold where you start becoming symptomatic. And then you have a uh, wide window of being symptomatic where at, the, at which time your cardiac output is still very compensated, right? So your RV undergoes hypertrophy. It's able to keep up with the increase in the PVR. See, one thing you have to understand the difference between a systemic hypertension and um, pulmonary arterial hypertension is the increase in, 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 in SVR and increase in PVR. The normal PVR is less than two woods units. Uh, really, it is about one and a half woods units. And if you look at the uh, what PVR, uh, on average PVR of a pulmonary arterial hypertension patient, it is about eight. So for a low pressure circuit, you are looking at an order of magnitude of four times, right? So normal PA pressure is mean of 15, and average mean PA pressure of a pulmonary arterial hypertension patient is between 40 and, and 50. So, but that never happens with systemic hypertension. Normal blood pressure is 120 with a mean of 80. You never have anybody's blood pressure being mean of 240, you know, that you never see. So, um, so that is why, you know, the RV really is not able to keep up compared to LV being able to keep up with essential hypertension because just the, the, the market increase in load is just too much. So, and th that kind of, I guess, compensation is something that we, we need to think about when we put it in perspective. Um, and in terms of treating, you know, these are some of the uh, general treatment measures Oral anticoagulants, you know, you really use it on idiopathic pH, especially patients who are on IV therapies because there is a risk of blood clot. Otherwise, 
uh, at least you know the, the current data there is no randomized control data there's a lot of registry data which is all over the place so at least our, uh, our center practice is use it only in patients with iv therapies and diuretics again to manage rv failure uh, and oxygen to manage the hypoxemia and digoxin to increase cardiac output a little bit uh, now when we look at uh, sort of these are the pa pah specific uh, therapies which have been approved so they essentially are in three you know targets the nitric oxide pathway uh, wherein you know nitric oxide works on cgmp and you know uh, that's what causes the sort of the, the smooth muscle uh, um, vasodilation uh, so and uh, so that, that essentially is uh, there are two classes of drugs one is the phosphodiesterase 5 uh, uh, in inhibitor and the other one is, is the soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator and the other pathway is the prostacyclin pathway where prostaglandin i2 um, again in, uh, increases camp to cause you know vasodilation and uh, uh an anti proliferation so th uh, that is acted upon by prostacyclin derivatives and analogs now and the endothelin pathway which really causes uh vascular proliferation so the endothelin uh, receptor antagonists which are both selective and non selective and we'll go over them a little bit so, you know relatively this is a young field in the sense that the uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension epidemic started after the fen fen you know epidemic in the 1980s so in the last 20 years with coming from no drug now we have about 14 drugs which have been approved and in in each of the uh, categories of uh, uh, mechanism of treatment that we just talked about so just going over a few things that uh, uh which are specific features of ph therapy um the eras are you know again uh, effective in early form of ph they do cause some volume retention so you just have to be careful in adding this in patients who are actively decompensating uh and uh, there is some added value in patients with connective tissue disease and also in patients with congenital heart disease so with patients with congenital heart disease which which is where all the ph therapies were first tried um most of them were first tried in eisenmenger's uh, syndrome and of course the flolan was very beneficial and the second which was really approved there was bosentan which is uh, endothelial receptor antagonist and it is very effective in patients with uh, uh, congenital heart disease and again uh, the other group of medications that we use are sildenafil and tadalafil uh, both are pd5 inhibitors uh, very well tolerated the side effects some of them you know, are actually to do with uh, the eye so if any of these patients with uh, uh with um uh sildenafil or tadalafil have eye problems then you have to worry about it because it can cause non ischemic uh you know uh, optic neuritis and it can potentially be you know deadly so we've got to be careful with that and uh in the same class is sgc stimulators which is riosequat which is a newly approved medication it is approved both for ph and also for ctaf and um, uh, in fact the, these the, the the beauty with this group of medications is that it is nitric oxide independent so you do not need endogenous nitric oxide for this to be effective and so even late in the disease this is fairly effective um, and um, so i i think the other slide the next slide was the prostacyclin uh, analog uh, slide so you know we had both um, mostly it was on time and then it's the only thing you need to know as uh, at least for the first year cardio you know cardiology fellows is iv epoprostenol or velitri it is a very short acting medication you will take care of some patients with velitri because uh, at least in our practice we have about 6 7 of them who might be coming in from time to time for whatever reason and i think currently one one is admitted right now so the thing for you to know is you know it is short acting so any time it it can lead to profound hemodynamic compromise in these patients so 
uh, you just have to be you know very careful with line exchanges you know usually our team is always available for questions or you know at least i'm available anytime so please feel free to reach out um, uh, with, with uh, you know these patients now if patients are on sub q tripostinil or iv tripostinil it's a little more forgiving because the half life of that is about 4 hours so uh, so uh, now there is an oral prostacyclin available called celexipag uh, which um, uh, has changed the treatment paradigm uh, definitely so this is something that you you guys can be asked in your um, as a board question, which is, you know, that this was sort of a pivotal trial. It's called Ambition, where they looked at uh, monotherapy versus combination therapy in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. And as you can see here, event-free survival in, you know, in, in these patients was much better with combination therapy compared to patients on monotherapy. So currently our practice is to start patients on a dual therapy with an ERA and a PD-5 inhibitor. So uh, again, the, the, so this is the approach to pH treatment. So there is very select few patients in whom we would use monotherapy. Predominantly, you know, our uh, practice is to use initial combination therapy. There are a few patients, again, in whom sequential may be appropriate, but for the most part, we always use, you know, uh, initial combination therapy. Uh, and there is clear evidence, you know, for that we should do that compared to monotherapy. Now, the only uh, caveat really here is to say that not all uh, combinations are equal. Uh, so when Bosentan was tried with sildenafil, because of drug-drug interactions, it was not a successful combination. So just something to keep in mind that, uh, you know, uh, currently, Ambrosentan and Ambrosentan with a PD-5 inhibitor is what is our preferred starting therapy. And uh, 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 this was, uh, again, uh, with combination therapy with Macitentan, showing that patients who got, uh, you know, combination therapy with Macitentan did better with 10 milligrams compared to just the placebo. Uh, again, here, inhaled iloprost, uh, which is a prostacycline added to an ERA, no real change in six-minute walk. Uh, however, you know, inhaled tropostinol added to these showed an improvement in six-minute walk, but no change time in clinical worsening. So not, not all of them are, are the same. So, however, when you look at, again, SGC stimulators, uh, there was a definite increase in six-minute walk uh, and uh, an improvement in time to clinical worsening. So... Uh, again, uh, something which acts on nitric oxide pathway and an ERA seem to be a good combination, except for you know, Bosentan, which we predominantly don't use it, at least in the, <clears throat> you know, in the developed world. Uh, again, this is showing the combination therapy for SGC stimulators or Riosiquat, that you know, patients who are on Riosiquat uh, do better than on monotherapy. And uh, this is Selexipag, which is uh, uh, oral prostacycline. And uh, uh, again, when, when used in patients who are already on a, you know, a dual or single agent, there was an improvement in composite of death and, and the, the composite. Um, however, there was no difference in mortality alone. So again, that, that's why this, this got approved. And uh, this we currently use predominantly as a third agent when patients are not doing well on dual agents. Now, there was an upfront three-drug study. It was called Triton, which just got uh, released this year, and it was not a positive study. So when you upfront use triple therapy, it was no different than upfront dual therapy. Uh, so uh, that was a little bit of a disappointment because we thought that, you know, upfront hitting everybody with triple therapy would be beneficial, but that was not the case. <clears throat> so how, you know, how do we make our decisions? So we look at the risk. You know, we remember we went through both the reveal risk score and also the European risk categorization. And then we see if patients are patients who have 
clinical RV failure, who have syncope, who are barely able to walk much, hypoxic, RV failure, those patients we essentially put on triple therapy, including an IV prostacycline. Intermediate low risk score, we usually do combination therapy. And every three months we do their reveal risk score. And so they get a six minute walk, they get an echo, they get a BNP. See which way they're progressing. Some people, you know, will be stable for a while and then some people will progress. Then when they progress, then we add therapy. And once they are high risk and they continue to progress, they get referred to lung transplant, which is really the only curative uh, procedure in these patients. Now, there are a few patients I don't think you, you, you need to know, but just for um, uh, you know, sake of education, there are a few patients in whom initial monotherapy is very appropriate, especially older patients with concomitant LV diastolic dysfunction. They just don't tolerate other therapies. So, uh, so they usually tolerate one therapy. And then patients with HIV and patients with portopulmonary hypertension have never been studied in any of these uh, clinical trials. So for them, uh, probably ideal to start them on monotherapy and see how they do, and then then add sequentially if they don't respond. So again, this is class one indication to start, you know, uh, ambicentin plus tadalafil, but again, you could use another ERA or PD5 as well, which is class 2A, because some patients don't tolerate ambicentin very well because of lower extremity edema or, or anemia. But uh, um, uh, again, so it, with sequential, if you want to go e either adding mesotentan or, or any of those medications to already existing PD-5 is very uh, appropriate. So this is sort of the treatment algorithm or management algorithm. You know, in treatment naive patients, you, you, you know, you first confirm your diagnosis and then, you know, you do a vasoreactive testing. They are vasoreactive, they get calcium channel therapy. This is, again, only in IPH, hereditary, and, and, and drug-induced pH uh, only. And then if they have low to intermediate risk, they get initial oral combination. And then after three to six months, you know, you reassess if they're low risk, continue to follow. If they progress, then you add therapy. And then if they are already high risk to begin with, then you start them on uh, IV prostacyclines and consider uh, lung transplant. So going back to our question, you know, the reason I put this up is because there's still some confusion because uh, I think our um, uh, published literature and our general uh, knowledge of pulmonary hypertension, everybody after the sixth symposium, uh, we all have at least accepted 20 as uh, maybe our new cutoff, but guidelines have not caught up to it. So I don't think you guys will get tested with this, but uh, uh, I think till the guidelines change, I think at least for, for treating peer pressure, you know, uh, probably is still going to be 25 because it's very difficult to get therapies approved if, if you don't, uh, if your mean PA is not 25. Uh, and then uh, the current guy, this, this, I think we, it's very well established and uh, it is dual therapy with the PD-5 and ERA and specifically it will be with Ambrisentan and Tadalafil. So with this, you know, I'm in this talk, but again, the, you know, PH is a tough disease to handle and uh, it is really a disease of the right ventricle in the sense that um, all the manifestations of symptoms and everything that patients deal with are due to right ventricle or failure over time. Um, and uh, we have therapies which uh, affect uh, both all the three pathways, which uh, also pathophysiologically affect vaso vasoconstriction and vascular remodeling. Um, and their uh, outlook looks much better, but Always keep in mind when you guys are in the echo lab, you see peer pressures of 60s, 70s, and the diastolic dysfunction is not that bad. Consider doing a right heart cath in those patients. If you have group three pulmonary arterial hypertension, any thoughts on vasodilator therapy in this population? And if so, what would you choose? So, uh, you you know, group three, it's difficult, right? Because a lot of them are there. Um, uh, pulmonary 
hypertension is really associated with the hypoxia, which is, you know, uh, associated with group three, uh, mm. all the intrinsic lung disease. So I think my first uh, sort of approach there is to make sure they're, they're on oxygen and their hypoxia is well treated. And there has been a mixed, you know, uh, uh, mixed results with all the studies. I mean, recently, Thaiways have got approved for, or at least not, did not get approved, but it was a positive study, which is inhaled tropostanol. But I, I do not start treatment unless I see RV dysfunction on echo. Because that tells me that the pulmonary hypertension that the patient has is bad enough to cause RV dysfunction. And that I feel like that has to be treated because I've had some experience where, you know, you treat very early and their hypoxia get worse. And uh, um, I, I, I'm a little conservative in treating those patients. Now, there are two varieties there too, you know, those patients who have connective tissue disease specifically, I think in them uh, where the pulmonary hypertension is more out of proportion to the intrinsic lung disease, those they need treatment because when you look at crest or scleroderma or any of those, they have a little bit of CTD ILD, which is very, very mild. But pulmonary, you know, their PVR is eight, 10. Uh, then it's definitely, it's like, like the diastolic dysfunction patients, right? And you have mean PA pressure is 45. It's not the wedge pressure, you know, uh, driving the, the mean PA pressure. So I think th those are two considerations. I think, I think if you look at the whole lung has honeycombing on both sides and your mean PA pressure is 30 with a PVR of five. I don't know that treating that will make you feel any better, but, um, so so the question is that there must be some critical cutoff when we say, you know, this pH is out of proportion to what chronic lung disease. Is that fair? That's fair. I don't know that we know it. Yeah. But if someone has severe pH, you think, um, and with evidence of RV dysfunction, you think it's it's reasonable to at least try pulmonary vasodilators and, and then... Yeah. So, there, so there, is very, there is known uh, data that... Uh, uh, that Leteris and um, which is Ambrosentan <clears throat> and uh, and also uh, Rio Sequat are not uh, you know uh, make make things worse. So right. so I okay. think in, in, in those two so patients, PD five inhibitors and Hill Tyveso these are agents that one can consider. Yeah, got it. Any other questions for Dr. Guha, guys? Yes, yeah, can you comment on for the fellows, you know, these, these folks with uh, bad artery failure, and PAH coming in with pericardial effusion, significant management to them? Yeah, so that's a tough question, right? So uh, I think uh, patients with uh, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension coming in with pericardial effusion. Um, first of all, it is very difficult to make a diagnosis of tamponade based just on echocardiogram because all your respiratory variations and all that, you know, kind of goes out of the window in presence of high PA pressures and in the presence of RV failure, you know, with dilated RV and a small LV because already that whole concept of interdependence is being driven here by RV failure more than just you know pericardial effusion. So that's one thing. So if you want to make a diagnosis of true tamponade, you need a right heart cath. Unless of course patients are hypotensive, you know that's a different uh, di different uh, animal. But uh, most of them are not. And in 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 that case, I think calling them as possible tamponade, I'm, I'm not very convinced because we've done enough right heart cats in them, and their index is normal and the right, you know, their wedge pressures are not really that elevated. So that's one thing. Secondly, you know, acutely draining those pericardial effusions in these patients can lead to acute dilatation of RV, severe TR, and uh, essentially a PE arrest. So there are two approaches to it. In Mayo and in Stanford and probably even in, uh, I don't know, in, in other, I think Germany or somewhere, they they are very they have been successful with 
putting a pericardial drain, but draining very, very, as soon as they put in a pericardial drain, they clamp it and they use uh, both, uh, I guess, um, uh, swan as well as uh, just the basic hemodynamics, like blood pressure and such to slowly drain it over time. And that is one way to do it. And the other way, we have been kind of with mixed success, I should say, is to do uh, uh, um, a drain, um, uh, a pericardial window, which I think is has risks. So usually I almost always, if you have a pericardial effusion causing tamponade with severe RV failure on IV therapies, then this patient needs a lung transplant. You know, all these other things that we do are just, you know, cosmetic. So... The, I would get lung transplant team involved, get them listed, and then we can decide what to do with it. But I usually leave it alone if it is not hemodynamically significant. The other thing you have to keep in mind with pericardial effusions in pH patients is that the company it keeps, you have to always see if this patient has HIV, lupus. If it is associated pH, then you have to make sure you're not dealing with the flare. You know, they might have a lupus flare and the pericardial effusion is entirely unrelated to RV failure. So I think you just have to, I guess, think about all these things before just saying, oh, let's go drain it. And also I think we should keep in, I, I feel that you should sort of uh, not jump the gun about this calling it tamponade on echo, uh, because I think it is very difficult diagnosis to make. Dr. Gua, this is Smith, one of the fellows. Um, I just had a question about the transplant aspect. Yeah. Um, like, at what point do you consider, uh, like, what level of RV dysfunction do you consider for heart transplant, or do you kind of expect some recovery of the RV after the lung transplant? So, good question. Uh, <laughs> I think, for the most part, RV will recover, unless you have somebody with intrinsic RV disease, which could happen in scleroderma. Uh, so our protocol here is if your RA pressure is consistently or persistent over 20 with a low index, despite all IV therapies and inotropes, then we consider them for heart double lung, which is a small, small minority. Otherwise, everybody gets a double lung and for the most part, they recover. So sarcoid and scleroderma would be two, two conditions with, which are kind of unknown, which is why we sort of look at, uh, you know, uh, I, we do an MRI to see if there is, you know, uh, uh, scarring and yeah. That's great. All right. Okay. Well, thank you.